artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hi, and this is episode 216. I am talking with John Danaher, Senior Lecturer in Law at National University of Ireland, Galway, co-editor of the book Robot Sex, Social and Ethical Implications, and author of the 2019 book Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work, an amazingly broad discourse on the future of work. He's published over 40 papers on topics including the risks of advanced AI, the meaning of life in the future of work, the ethics of human enhancement, the intersection of law and neuroscience, the utility of brain-based lie detection, and the philosophy of religion. His work has appeared in The Guardian, Eon, and The Philosopher's Magazine. Last week, we talked about how much jobs may be automated and the methodology behind studies of that, the impact of automation on job satisfaction, the role of academia, and a lot more. This week, we're going to talk about generative AI extending our minds, the Luddite fallacy, and why this time things will be different, the effects of automation on class structure, and much more. Let's get back to the interview with John Danaher. And so I'd like to talk about those large language models because they have hit the mainstream. Everyone now knows what AI is. The vast majority of the population has even had a personal experience of it in the last 18 months now. And I'm wondering how that would change or illuminate or illustrate things that you had said in your last book. And I want to introduce that with one particular example, because you talk about different types of tool with respect to the extended mind thesis, mm. which is one of my favorite things to discuss on this podcast, the notion that something, some device or artifact outside of your body which you use in conducting some inquiry or analysis should be considered to be part of your mind. They're Clark and Chalmers' work, and you go to some length to distinguish what should qualify for that based on interaction. You say, for instance, Google Maps would qualify because there is a, an interaction with it. There's a dialogue, an exchange of some kind to converge on what it is you actually want. Well, a, a large language model takes that to a much higher degree. So I'm wondering, does that increased amount of coupling there between the tool and the human with a large language model, how does that affect your thinking on the extended mind thesis and the impact of large language models? I, I mean, I think language models are, I prefer to use the terminology of just generative AI models rather than language models per se, but I think they occupy an interesting sort of liminal space uh, so just, let me just say, in the book, I make distinctions between three different kinds of cognitive artifacts that humans use. And one of them doesn't particularly matter for this conversation, but there's two distinctions that really matter here as I draw a contrast between cognitive artifacts that enhance human cognition in the sense that they improve us or they extend our abilities, and then other artifacts that compete with our minds, essentially. So, I mean, a simple illustration of this is the contrast between a digital calculator and an abacus, right? An abacus, there's an interactive relationship between the human and the abacus. And actually people who use abacai, I guess, to learn mathematics and can become extremely fast calculators and it can actually change the way they think about simple kind of arithmetic processes. So it changes their internal mental representation of mathematical problems and also enhances their ability to solve mathematical problems a digital calculator is very different. It's essentially like an outsourcing device. You just get the calculator to do everything for you. And you don't have to worry about the arithmetical thing anymore, right? And the mental representation of that. You could do it, I suppose, if you wanted to, but you don't have to. And generative AI, on the one hand, it has features that make it more like an abacus. And on the other hand, it has features that make it more like a digital calculator. A lot of it kind of boils down to how the user approaches it. So if you take something like drafting a, a report or an essay or a piece of research that I might do, there are ways of using generative AI that are very sort of interactive and iterative. 
you prompt it with something, you fit something back to you, you edit it, you revise it, you develop, you generate something more through the sum of the two parts than you would get just by doing it on your own. But of course, you can also just say, give me the whole draft paper in a sense without any input. The worry, of course, when it comes to, say, students and education is that they'll just do that or they'll fall to the easiest option. Or we don't know, we can't tell the difference between the people who do that and the people who approach it in a more iterative way. So yeah, it has some sort of troubling features when it comes to that framework that I offered and that it, it doesn't sort of neatly fit into either category. It can be used, I think, as a, an enhancing artifact that does extend and develop cognition, but it can also be used as a competitive replacing artifact that replaces human cognition and might lead to sort of the atrophy of, of human powers or capacities. Well, and that replacement fear is one of the drivers behind this big debate about whether technology is going to result in fewer jobs or more jobs. And the argument that it is going to result in more jobs says that this has always been the case in the past, that every piece of new technology that has been introduced may have eliminated some jobs, but has ended up creating far more. And certainly that is a case that is easy to substantiate. And on the other hand, you cite a paper by Darren Asimoglu and Pasquale Restrepo concluding that the introduction of one robot worker into the US would displace on net 5.6 workers and decrease average wages by 0.5%. And that's one of several arguments that you make that is countering the Luddite fallacy. In other words, saying that yet this time things will be different. And so can you encapsulate why this time to you things appear to be different? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things you can point to. You can point to sort of general statistical trends. Some I mean, of the Asimoglu Restrepo paper, and they've written a few papers along the line since I wrote that book, which point to similar results. Obviously, there's been a long-standing debate on economic theory about whether technology actually replaces jobs or whether it generates more jobs. And their paper was an attempt to kind of cut through that debate with statistical evidence to say, okay, for every one robot introduced in a factory in the US within certain zones that they were studying, how many jobs were actually created or how many jobs were lost? And they came up with that figure that actually it's an estimate based on theoretical model that this number of jobs was lost per robot introduced. And subsequent results seem to have confirmed that to some extent. So you can point to things like that, that cut through that sort of theoretical debate. There's also general statistical trends about you know, declining percentage of participation in the workforce and the phenomenon of underwork, people like having less work overall, even if they're still working in terms of the number of hours of their participation in work has gone down over time. The labor force participation rate in most developed economies is probably lower than many people think it is, right? Probably around about 60%, maybe trending a bit lower over time in most economies. That's 60% of the adult population that is eligible to work, that are actually working. So there's, there's a huge percentage of people that are not working. I guess like complexity to that is changes in gender participation over time in the workforce that did increase the rate of participation for a certain period of time in the 20th century, but there's now that trend is slightly reversed since then. That's one thing. You can point to more, less hard kind of data. They can look at things around the pace of change in technology, right? So one of the claims that would be made is that, okay, technology might displace some workers from some tasks or some jobs perhaps will become obsolete, but we can retrain and redevelop workers. Or even if one generation of workers lose out, we can train the next generation of workers to do things that are not replaced by machines or that are complementary to what machines do. That might not be true anymore, given the pace of development. A few years ago, everyone was talking about training people to be computer coders. That was the sort of opportunity in the future. But now there are some questions being asked around that, uh, whether that is a viable pathway forward, given the fact that these generative AI systems are actually reasonably good at, at coding. Although... I don't want to be too kind of overstating or overhyping that case either because there's complexities to that, which you can get back to. And the other thing, and is a slightly more theoretical point, which is that the assumption is that there's always these adjacent tasks that people can migrate to. Okay, so the AI can write the paper for you if you're an academic, but it can't actually do the 
primary research, right? It can't perform the experiment in the field or something like this. And, you know, to a certain extent, that logic holds up. So the idea is that, you know, you focus on doing the experiment and getting that right, and then you use the technology to help you write the paper in the end. But actually, you know, there are people developing robots and machines that will do experiments as well, but that'll come up with experimental hypotheses and that will actually perform at least rudimentary experiments. And, you know, there have been developments in that in the past 10 years. So at a certain point in time, there aren't all these adjacent tasks for you to migrate into, particularly if you look at technological development in a holistic sense, rather than focusing on one particular technology and what it does, but focusing on all the different technologies that are being developed simultaneously means that maybe we have less space to flee into when it comes to finding employment in the future. So yeah, I tend to point to those three things. General trends and data that we can observe, the pace of technological change, and whether we have the capacity to up-train or upskill people to find new opportunities within the space of time before the next sort of wave of displacement or wave of technological disruption takes place, and also whether there are all these kind of adjacent spaces, adjacent tasks for us to flee into. At a certain point in time, it seems like we're going to run out of space, particularly when you look at all the trend lines at once, rather than just one particular trend line. Run out of space for what? I mean, in a very conceptual sense, like the space of things that humans can do that are economically productive, ah. right? Now, I, there's a huge counter-argument to all of that, by the way, which is that economists might say that that's completely the wrong way of looking at us, right? But that analogy that I've used assumes that there is a sort of finite amount of space for people to migrate into. But actually, what is economically viable can vary significantly over time. It's wrong to think of it in terms of this finite block of stuff that people can do. It's sometimes referred to as the lump of labor fallacy, which is the idea that there's mm -hmm. this like single lump of things that humans can do, labor that can be performed, that is economically rewarded and viable. So you're saying that economists haven't decided whether this is a zero-sum game or not? Yeah, I mean, I think the mainstream view is probably that it's not a zero-sum game. But I think there's complexities to that because, so what could we do if machines hypothetically can do all the things that are currently economically rewarded, what would people migrate into? So sometimes people look at analogies with like certain kinds of leisure activities in games that maybe they become the focus of our lives. Let's take, let's take something that is already automated as an example, right? Which is maybe like professional chess playing, right? So it's already well known that computers are better than humans at chess. Okay, we've lost that battle. But that doesn't mean, of course, that there are no human chess players or, or professional tournaments, and you know, there are some very successful people in the post-AI age. But is that a viable career path for everybody? Or is that a kind of economic or labor market that is subject to what we might call like the superstar effect? That is, there's only a few people that can actually capture the value in that market. That's something else I discuss in the book, this phenomenon of superstar markets, is that the modern digital economy, like let's say the online influencer sphere, or these kind of professional sports or musicians or entertainment markets, that they are subject to these kind of superstar effects, which is that there are a couple of people who are doing really well. You know, Taylor Swift is doing very well, but actually the vast majority of musicians are struggling to get by and make a living. And that could be the future for most people, right. which is that we're all part of these sort of superstar leisure entertainment markets, which can't be easily replaced by AI, because that it's not about efficiency necessarily in production that makes you valuable in those markets. It's something more unique or interpersonal and not replaceable by machines, but that maybe isn't a viable career path for most people. Yes, uh, writing books and podcasting also seem to be superstar markets. And when you were talking there about AI writing code, I was reminded of a recent study showing that 52% of the code generated by some was found to have bugs. And I think that's one of the nuances that we need to bear in mind there. I want to ask about how automation affects class stratification. If we have, say, a middle class, and then we have an, on one side, we have an investor or owner class, and on the other side, we have a menial job underclass. How is automation changing those dividing lines? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And it's something that I'm particularly interested in actually at the moment, because this might be one of the interesting features of generative AI, that it, it might have a sort of counterintuitive impact on class and inequality and stratification in society. Although, as I will explain in a moment, that comes with a grain of salt. So the 
dominant view in the latter part of the 20th century, let's say, sort of from 1980 onwards, is that there's been growing inequality and stratification in particularly developed economies. This is a thesis that has been pushed by several people that the listeners to this podcast might be aware of. But the French economist Thomas Piketty is a famous illustration of this about the growing income inequality divide between the top 10%, the top 1%, and the top 1% and everyone else. David Alter is a the economist based at MIT has also written some interesting papers on the polarization of the workforce in the U.S. That effectively what happened with the computerization revolution in the 1980s is that, to a large extent, it replaced what we might call middle-income, middle-skill jobs, right? Manufacturing jobs, you know, certain routine forms of office work. A lot of people who were doing very well, having homeowners with two kids, sending them to college, all that kind of thing, they lost out heavily in that computerization revolution from the 1980s onwards. And the workforce was pulverized into two other forms of work, what you call manual work. And I can't remember the name he had on the other form of work, but it was maybe creative work or something along those lines, which is manual work is unskilled labor. Unskilled, by the way, for an economist has a particular meaning. It doesn't necessarily mean unskilled. It means um, low educational barriers to participation in, in the work. But you're typically talking about skill, sort of manually dexterous work that is not easily automatable, let's say, not easily routinized, actually, is the term that's used. So cutting people's hair is a good example of this, right? It's not something that's easily automatable. You can probably earn a certain amount of money from it, but there's a, a cap or limitation on it. If for most people doing it, unless you're a hairdresser to the stars or something like this. And then the creative work is high education, highly skilled workers who to creative problem-solving work. There's relatively fewer of those kinds of jobs, and there's a lot of manual work out there. But a lot of the manual work is actually part-time, or it's subject to kind of outsourcing effects within firms. So firms don't hire security guards anymore. They outsource that task to another firm that hires the security guards, and they kind of contract to them uh, rather than directly employing them. Uh, so they're often subject to more precarious forms of unemployment. And so that's one of the things that's pushed inequality, is that polarization in the workforce as a result of technology, as a result of computerization. So the question is, yeah, what will AI do? One plausible hypothesis, or has seemed plausible in recent years, is that AI is just going to push that polarization to the nth degree, right? You'll have a handful of people doing highly rewarded, highly paid work, creative management type work. They'll win out. All the owners of the capital as well, the owners of the machines, the technology, the infrastructure, They'll do well. Sam Altman will do well from the AI revolution, but Joe Sixpack, computer programmer, won't do well. Right? He'll lose that. So that's been the the assumption, really. That was the dominant assumption is that it's just going to continue to push that polarization and stratification. Is that true? There's been a bit of a counter narrative in the past two years about generative AI is that it may not have that effect. So the initial assumption was that okay, generative AI because it has this sort of iterative feature to it that you have to be a sort of skilled user of the technology to get the most from it. I mean, to go back to the example that you just gave about programming and bugs and programming, right? One of the claims that programmers made is that, well, okay, you can generate code with the AI, but it's prone to bugs or inconsistencies or problems. And you actually have to be a skilled, knowledgeable programmer to debug it and check these things out. So if you're a skilled programmer, you can benefit from the technology. It can make you more efficient and more productive. But if you're an unskilled programmer or a less skilled programmer, let's say, you can't actually benefit from it. And this is the, the argument I should say that academics might make, right? Students, because they don't know anything, that's a stereotype, of course, not true, but they can't actually check for the errors in the papers that the AI generates. Whereas academics who know stuff are able to do that. I don't know if that's true, by the way, but that's the assumption. So the assumption, in a sense, is that the cognitively rich will get richer as a result of this technology. The people who are already skilled will do better as a, with this technology, and the people who are less skilled will do worse. That said, there's at least half a dozen papers that have been published in the past 18 months that suggest that the opposite is true, that actually generative AI displays an inverse skills bias, which is that it benefits the less skilled worker as opposed to the, the more skilled worker. The first study here was done by Eric Brynjolfsson and his colleagues on call center workers, which looked at the impact of a chatbot assistant on their productivity in the work, and it found that 
the workers with less experience or less skilled were more productive as a result of the use of this AI assistant, whereas their more skilled colleagues, more experienced colleagues actually did worse or didn't benefit as much as a result of the technology, if at all. I mean, they found negligible results, I think, for the more skilled workers. And there have been several studies that basically replicate that effect in other kinds of work. So there's a study done on law students and writing kind of legal briefs and documents. There's a study done on people writing ad copy, skilled copywriters versus unskilled copywriters. There's a study, probably the most elaborate study so far, by uh, Della Aqua, is the lead author on it, and a bunch of other people. They did a study with the Boston Consulting Group. They looked at more experienced and less experienced consultants and whether AI increased their productivity or not. And they found that AI increased productivity on certain kinds of tasks for everyone, but actually the less skilled consultants benefited more than the more skilled consultants. So this trend, by the way, has led some people, such as David Alter, who is the person who hypothesized the polarization effect, to suggest that generative AI may have the potential to reverse the inequalities that we've witnessed over the past four decades or so since the 1980s. And that you might get this kind of great equalization, perhaps, as a result of this latest technological disruption. And this also might be one reason why there's such sort of hand-wringing and soul-searching amongst knowledge workers is that as these skilled workers, they are the ones that feel most threatened by this latest wave of technological disruption, but it actually might benefit most other people. So, And that's a kind of utopian narrative, mm. but that's something that does come out of, of recent research. I want to get to the utopia in a moment. You have made me think about something that a recent guest, Matt Bean, illuminated for me, which is a distinction between the effects of automation on the execution of a task by differently capable types of worker and the effect of that upon their skill accumulation or the rate at which new people are trained in that profession. And those can move in opposite directions. Looking at a time here, I want to devote some time to Utopia, which is a large part of your book and your title. And you talk about futures that resemble the movie WALL-E, where humans go around in motorized lounge chairs watching videos, and apparently this is their idea of their best life. And I'm wondering, is this, in your mind, an academic future or is it likely? Is it something you explore for the sake of filling out a space? Or is it something that seems to you to be on the main path that is plausible that we could wind up in this future where we have taken care of so many challenges that there really aren't any left for humans to bother themselves with? Yeah, I think that Wally, the future depiction of Wally, which for people who don't know, involves humans essentially becoming grotesquely obese and sitting in these floating chairs all day being fed a constant stream of, of light entertainment and fast food and junk food, right? That it's, it's clearly satire. That's what it's there for. It's supposed to satirize a certain element or aspect of humanity. But sometimes the you know, satire is uh, or can be close to the truth. I don't think we'll end up in the future depicted in Wally. Uh, maybe that's because the future depicted in Wally is a kind of perfect self-negating prophecy, right? With that people witness that and they say, well, that's definitely not what we want to end up with. And hopefully that's the case. Some people claim that George Orwell's 1984 is the perfect self-negating prophecy, but of course, it's not clear that we haven't ended up in, in that world. It may just be a slightly different formation to it. And of course, he was himself writing about an actual part of the world that, that he felt was like that at the time. So I view it as a useful scenario to think about, to frame our thinking about the direction that we could go down with technology. I don't view it as a prediction. I don't think it's likely that we'll end up with it. But we may end up with something closer to it than we would like. Because, I mean, essentially what, what Wally does is it says, well, humans are lazy in a sense, right? That, and if given the option, we'll take the easy way out, or we can be easily led into or manipulated into taking the easy way out and not developing our capacities or abilities. And while I... I don't think that is necessarily a, a fair characterization of humanity. I think you know many people do have drive and ambition to push themselves forward. There is certainly always that temptation there for a considerable portion of people and even 
more ambitious people to take the easy way out. And if they have no options left to them as a result of technology, that may be the direction in which they go. So that's sort of my take on Is it a necessary characteristic of utopias that they be stagnant? It seems every one that I can think of has no learning or growth occurring for its inhabitants. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things I do in the book is I draw a contrast between two main styles of utopia. And I'm thinking here in particular in terms of the utopian literary tradition, essentially kickstarted by the first book with the title of Utopia, which, of course, is Thomas More's book from the 1600s. Sorry, I almost forgot his name there for a moment. And they all tend to fall into a class of what I call blueprint utopias. The term isn't mine, by the way, so I don't want to claim ownership of the term, which is that they are these detailed maps of the ideal society. This is what the ideal society will look like. Right. Plato was doing this in the Republic 2,500 years ago, but you can also find Thomas More doing it. A slightly more notorious example or egregious example it might be somebody like the behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner, who did something similar in his Walden 2.0 book in the 1940s, I think. So they're often like highly prescriptive, they're highly ideological, they're people with a very sort of narrow vision of what humanity consists of and what human flourishing consists of. And actually, if you read most of those utopian blueprints, they seem rather stifling and unpleasant places to live, right? So I think there's a stagnancy to a lot of those blueprint-type utopian narratives. There is a contrasting school of thought and tradition, maybe epitomized by, to some extent, the work of H.G. Wells, a modern utopia book he wrote. Not necessarily the contents of the book itself, but some of the philosophy or theory within it, which adopts a model which... I and others have referred to as the horizontal model of utopia, which is that there is no fixed blueprint for the ideal society. There is rather a kind of ever-expanding horizon of possibilities. And that the ideal society is not a closed, rigid, controlled, constrained one, but actually an open, kind of dynamic, diverse one. And that's sort of the vision that I like to push forward in the book, Automation Utopia. And I mean, that's the big question, I think, when it comes to technology, is that will technology expand the horizon of possibility for humans in the future, or will it constrain and narrow it down? Will it restrict human flourishing to a very kind of limited patch, like Wally, in a sense that there's a kind of flourishing there, I guess, there's a kind of pleasure being derived from existence, but it seems very narrow and limited, or will it enable greater diversity and growth for mm. humanity? I just want to comment, I think there's an argument there for positive use of virtual world immersion much is made of how putting people into virtual worlds would be escaping reality but it occurs to me that virtual worlds can be crafted to provide them with many more learning opportunities than might exist in the real world if they're in some kind of dead-end job particularly and so that might be a way that people could grow and learn faster than by not being in such environments. That's probably a classic utopian thinking right there. Yeah, I mean, the last chapter of the book or the second last chapter of the book is called The Virtual Utopia, in which I kind of argue for a variation on that. So I, I am supportive of what you say, but I think you're right that to a lot of people that'll sound Aliana-ish and naive because one of the big questions around, let's say, virtual utopia and immersive technology is, again, who owns the means of production in a sense? Like, who owns the means of producing these utopias? And there's a concern there about kind of control and domination by an elite technocratic class or group of technologists, and they might have a more limited vision of utopia and flourishing than you do, right? I mean, the movie The Matrix, in a sense, depicts a variation of that, and it doesn't look utopian to a lot of people. And that's maybe parody or satire to an extent, but there's a warning within that as well about how we pursue that vision of the virtual utopia. I want to finish up with one question here, prompted by, I think it was around the turn of the century, there was an author, I think it was Francis Fukuyama, who yeah. wrote about the end of history, which, if I can encapsulate it briefly, seemed to be saying that things had become extremely stable and predictable and weren't going to be changing very much. At least that was the way everyone seemed to take it, and that was invalidated rather quickly by a number of developments. But I wonder whether exponential automation and the exponential changes that it wreaks 
is introducing a kind of volatility that might in particular have the effect of invalidating some long-held models that economists, for instance, are fond of, and whether we are heading towards a inherently far less predictable future with respect to job markets. Yeah, the school of thought that I come from and that I, I guess, defend and support in the book is of the sort of disruptive, accelerating change mindset that, yeah, there is something different about the present moment compared to the past and that we are entering a more disruptive period of time, at least when it comes to these kinds of issues. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I am a, on paper as being a defender of that view. If nothing else, I'm incredibly non-committal or I have a tendency perhaps to equivocate on certain key issues or I can see the arguments on the side. So you know, one of the things that strikes you about let's say even the history of debates about technology is how repetitive they can be and how like the same themes or issues come up over and over again. It, there's always the same kind of issues around control and ownership and freedom and autonomy and inequality. And these debates have been playing out in various ways throughout human history. I mentioned at the start of this episode, you know, the impact of agriculture on inequality and the leisure lifestyle and Marshall Salm's thesis of the original leisure class. So it is strange how sort of cyclical or repetitive these things can be too. So I guess I'm not entirely sure where I, where I really come down in on this or where my true commitments are. I think maybe I could paraphrase a line from, it was a novel by Robert Heinlein, Stranger in a Strange Land, where it be something like, on Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm an accelerating change, disruptive person. But then on Thursdays and Fridays, I, I'm a believer in you know, nothing really changes in history. It's all just repeating and rhyming. And then I take the weekends off or something like that. <clears throat> Illustrating the importance of not wanting to be encapsulated with a single label there. Well, thank you. Do you have any words of wisdom, suggestions for listeners on meta takeaways for how to approach their career path in general in a world where changes that you have researched are accelerating? Yeah, I mean, I suppose this is drawing from my own personal experience, but I think if you want to have a job or career trajectory that is relatively resilient from technological disruption or that you can sustain a, a form of employment that is less vulnerable to these kinds of threats, I think Think about the job that you do and the task list associated with it. And if it is a broad and diverse set of tasks, you're probably less easily displaceable by technology. But if you basically just do one thing, and that's the only thing that you are good at, there's a danger that you are more easily replaceable, unless you exist in one of these superstar markets mm -hmm. where you are the superstar. That's what I would say. Great. So Taylor Swift, you're fine, just in case she's listening. Thank you. We've been talking about your book, Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work. There will be a link to that in the show notes and transcript. John, do you have uh, any upcoming projects or other work that you want to tell our listeners about and where they can find out more about what you're doing? So, so one of my recent research interests is in the use of generative AI models to create digital duplicates of real people. So I could create a an AI version of myself that might engage in, in personal tutoring sessions with my students or something along these lines. I'm looking at the sort of ethical and societal implications of that, so I have a, a I, couple of papers. I will attest that I'm pretty sure that, that I am not talking to that right now. Well, yes, I mean, it's, it's probably fair to say that you're not, but who knows? Maybe it's a really good sort of audiovisual generation as well, but it seems the technology we have isn't quite there for this sort of real-time level of conversation that we're having right now. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I, I have a paper coming out that I co-authored with a guy called Sven Nyholm, who's a colleague of mine based in Munich, who I've written a lot of papers with, and I've also done a podcast with, I would add, called This is Technology Ethics, that people want to listen to, but we're looking at ways in which the use of that kind of technology could be permissible or impermissible. So a classic ethical analysis of it, but that is a paper that is coming out in AI Ethics as we're recording this pretty soon, so like in the next couple of days. But I don't know when this is released, so hopefully it'll already be out by the time it's released. Fantastic. Well, thank you, John Danaher, for coming on AI and You. And thank you again, Peter, for inviting me. That's the end of the interview. 
Taylor Swift, if you are listening and want to come on the show, my younger daughter would very much appreciate it, and we will find something to talk about. If you're not Taylor Swift, please give us a five-star rating and glowing review on your podcast platform of choice. There's a link to John's book in the show notes and transcript. In today's news ripped from the headlines about AI, research at MIT suggests that the oft-repeated news that GPT-4 aced the bar exam was false and that it didn't even break the 70th percentile. You may remember this claim from last year, when OpenAI said that GPT-3.5 scored in the bottom 10% of test takers on a simulated bar exam, whereas GPT-4, which they had just released, scored in the top 10%. But the study, by doctoral student Eric Martinez at MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Science, said that GPT-4 only scored in the top 10% when compared with repeat test takers, people who had already failed the exam at least once. In a more general comparison, GPT-4 scored in the 69th percentile of all test takers and in the 48th percentile of those taking the test for the first time. Furthermore, focusing on the essay writing section of the test, it landed in the 48th percentile of all test takers and in the 15th percentile of those taking the test for the first time in that section. Now, it would still pass the bar, so if that's the criterion you're looking to judge by, nothing has changed. And certainly, it will only get better, so the claimed results will become real results soon enough. But it's important to have an accurate understanding of what's really going on here and not get swept up in claims that we'd like to believe that aren't factually correct. Next week, we'll have a special episode where I'll collect some recent thoughts on one of the most important topics to me, AI in education, which we talked about last year, but so much has happened since then. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, It's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U.net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening. 